Today's discussion is with Professor, Math Professor Matthew Selganik, the author of Bit by Bit, Social Research in the Digital Age, which won the APOR Book Award in 2022, and the Prose Award from Matt, the can you hear it? And the Prose Award from the Association of American Publishers. Thank you, Professor Selganik, for joining us at Book Club 2.0. I'm Samantha Goldstein, a member of the DC APOR Program Committee, and I'm your host for this session. DC APOR's Book Club 2.0 series couldn't be possible without the DC APOR Program Committee. If this is your first time coming to Book Club 2.0, welcome. Our goal for this series is to provide a fun and interactive forum to review and discuss the latest publications in the field of survey methodology and public opinion research, and to be given the opportunity to engage directly with those responsible for the books. Professor Solganik will present some highlights and key insights from the book. Please be sure to mute yourself unless asking a question or participating in the discussion. Professor Solganik will occasionally pause for questions throughout his presentation, so feel free to chime in then. You can also post thoughts and questions in the chat box as they come up, which we will be monitoring throughout the session. We'll also open up the floor for discussion at the end of the presentation. I encourage you to turn on your cameras and ask your questions or provide feedback directly. You're also welcome to contribute reactions and comments to each other and with Professor Solganik. Remember, some of the most helpful insights often come from more unstructured conversations, so let's try to mimic that on this Zoom call. At the end of the hour, I'll announce the name of the lucky DC APOR member who will win a copy of this session's book. If you're interested in being eligible for winning copies of the books in future book clubs, please consider becoming a DC APOR member. You can do it through your APOR membership or directly on DC APOR's website. It is now my pleasure to introduce the speaker. Matthew Selganik is professor of sociology at Princeton University. He is also affiliated with several of Princeton's interdisciplinary research centers, including the Center for Information Technology Policy, the Office of Population Research, and the Center for Statistics and Machine Learning. His research interests include computational social science and social networks. He is the author of Bit by Bit, Social Research in the Digital Age. He is currently on sabbatical at the Institute for Advanced Study. Professor Solganik's research has been published in journals such as Science, PNAS, Sociological Methodology, and Journal of the American Statistical Association. His papers have won the outstanding article from the Mathematical Sociology section of the American Sociological Association, twice, and the Outstanding Statistical Application Award from the American Statistical Association. Popular accounts of his work have appeared in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, The Economist, and The New Yorker. He is currently on the board of directors of Mathematica. During sabbaticals from Princeton, he has been a visiting professor at Cornell Tech, a senior researcher at Microsoft, and professor in residence at The New York Times. Over to you, Professor Solganik. Thank you so much, Samantha. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I'm really delighted to have a chance to talk about bit by bit with you all. I was really honored to receive the APOR Book Award, uh, in part because the book draws so much on public opinion research. So it was very, um, it felt really good to have it recognized by a community that I drew so much from. And also another thing that made the book, the award especially nice was that it required the book to have been published for more than three years. So it, the award came about five years after the book was published. And this was particularly, meaningful given that the book is about um, kind of a rapidly changing area. One of the things as I was writing the book, I tried very hard to make sure the book would not be out of date five years after it was written, which may seem trivial, but is actually pretty hard when you're writing about technology. And so I was very, very happy to see that the book did have some of the staying power uh, that I was hoping and, and we'll be able to talk a little bit more in this talk about that. And so, we have about an hour. Um, Samantha suggested I talk for about 40 minutes, and then we have about 20 minutes for discussion. As she mentioned, the unstructured discussion is often very generative, so we will definitely have time for that. If you have questions as we're going, feel free to ask. Um, also, at the end of the talk, I'll briefly mention some of the things I'm working on now. So let's start by talking about bit by bit. Um, so. This is bit by bit. And um, one way that I like to think about this book uh, is that I spend time in really two different communities. I'm trained as a sociologist. 
I work in a sociology department. I spend a lot of time with other social scientists. I also spend time with a lot of data scientists. So for example, I did a sabbatical at Microsoft Research. I have a lot of colleagues in computer science and I see these two thriving communities, um, but I see each one is missing something that the other has to offer. So each one comes with opportunities to learn from the other and with opportunities to contribute to the other. And so this book is like my attempt to get them together. Uh, so it's like you have two friends that know each other and you think they would hit it off so you have a party so that they can meet each other. That's kind of like what I'm trying to do in this book. So it's trying to write in a certain way also that has no prerequisites either based on social science training or computer science training. So this is an attempt to bring together the ideas from these two communities. Um, so one of the things that happened as I was working on this book, um, and it still happens even five years after I've worked on this book, is people ask me like, hey, Matt, isn't computational social science just a fad? So obviously if you're writing a book, you hope that you don't wanna write a book about something that is popular now, but will become less popular in the future. Um, and the answer to this question that I always gave, and I think it's held up pretty well is no, computational social science is not a fad. So first, what is computational social science? So I would say broadly, it's about combining ideas from social science and data science. And why is this not a fad? So there is certainly a lot of fad-like elements in what's happening. You'll see uh, in MySpace, a lot of universities are starting centers related to this with very loosely defined goals and scopes. You see a lot of commercial activity also with very loosely defined goals and scopes, but it's clear there's a lot of energy here and that energy is not going away. And that energy really comes from a broad shift in society. So we are transitioning from an analog age to a digital age. So if you think about lots of activities that you used to do, like reading a physical newspaper, now you do that online, it leaves digital traces. Spending cash, increasingly we spend money digitally and so on. So it is computational social science is not just something that's created by what professors are talking about or what companies are talking about, it's driven by this fundamental change in society. And so I think as researchers, we have the choice of taking advantage of this change and riding all this energy or being left behind. So I choose to get on board and ride this energy and try to figure out how we can take advantage of it. Because it's not obviously clear that the things that, the ways that society are changing, those are not always the ways that we as researchers would define, would like society to change. It's not always the most convenient for us, uh, but we can adapt and we can um, make do with what's happening now and what's gonna happen in the next five to 10 years. So I think computational social science is not a fad, uh, but that is not to say that there is not fad-like things happening. So this is a graph uh, that I love from the company Gartner. They use it to talk about what happens when a new technology gets introduced. So you can see the x-axis here is time, the y-axis is visibility, and initially there's some technology trigger. So this could be the change in the world moving to digitization. And then we move to this peak of inflated expectations. So this is maybe where we were with big data five. I mean, everyone is in a different place going through this hype cycle, but you know, there was a time where big data was going to cure cancer and, and poverty and make everyone happy. And then we kind of quickly realized that's probably not going to happen. And then we moved into kind of a trough of despair where we thought, oh, there's all these problems with big data. They're non-representative. They encode societal biases and so on. All of these things are true. But then eventually we figure out how to overcome these problems and we move into this plateau of productivity. And so one way to think about what I was trying to do with bit by bit is to push down the peak of inflated expectations, push up the trough of despair, and then get to the plateau of productivity as quickly as possible. So now I wanna just mention briefly what I think that plateau of productivity would look like. So it does not mean changing our goals. So I speak as a research, as a professor. So like my goal is to understand the world and, and create new knowledge. 
And so that's not going to change because I have access to new tools. These are just tools that help me achieve my goals in a new way. They don't change my goals. The second thing is just because I have new tools doesn't mean I wouldn't use old tools. So if you went to uh, a doctor and a doctor said, oh, I have an x-ray machine now. I'm not going to talk to my patients. I'm not going to touch my patients. I'm only going to use an x-ray machine. You would say, oh, that's a crazy doctor. Uh, but you would want a doctor that is willing to embrace these new tools in combination with existing tools. So again, the plateau of productivity, it means, I think, digital uh, research methods combined with methods that we've used in the past. It also means modernizing the methods that we've used in the past to take advantage of the infrastructure that exists today. So as I mentioned in the introduction, a goal of this book was not to go out of date before it was even printed. I mean, I, I said five years, that was pretty optimistic. I don't know if you know, but printing a physical book takes a long time by the standards of the internet. Uh, and so I, I have actually on my bookshelf a bunch of books that are now quite out of date. Uh, and so the question is, how do you write a book that's not going to go out of date? And one of the key ideas was to have the right level of abstraction. So what do I mean by that? So I could write a book about how to use Twitter for public opinion research, for example, but that book will go out of date very quickly. In fact, Twitter may be out of business in five years, maybe out of business in two years for all we know, um, given what's happening now. So we don't want to write about specific platforms, not just because those platforms will be going out of business anytime soon, but also because the platforms undergo dramatic changes. Like Twitter five years ago is really different than Twitter today. And I'm pretty sure Twitter five years from now will also be very different. Uh, I don't know how it will be different. If I knew how it would be different, I would be a venture capitalist and not a professor, but I do know it's going to be different. Um, and so if you want to find the right kind of abstraction that's going to make sense in the future, I think it makes sense to look back more to the past. And so you can say, what ideas have researchers developed in the social sciences that made sense 50 years ago? that makes sense today, those ideas at the right level of abstraction are likely to be really useful 50 years in the future. And so to me, the right abstraction here is about research design. So research design, when I say research design, what I mean is the process of connecting questions and answers. So research design is not about abstract theory and, and Marx and Weber, and it's not about statistical methods, machine learning, asymptotic properties of estimators. It's about the kind of glue in between. And these are kind of general recipes. So an example of a research design is a randomized control trial. So a randomized control trial is not a question. It's not how does this COVID vaccine work or does this COVID vaccine work? And it's not an answer. It's not a statistical test, it's not a p-value but it's a recipe for connecting questions and answers. And these kinds of recipes, I think, are the way that we can use ideas from the past and take those into the future. So the book is really organized around abstract research designs, many of which will be familiar to you on the call, um, which I think is a good thing, but I think each of these designs changes as we move from the analog age to the digital age. The strengths and weaknesses of these designs change, and this design sp the space for what is possible now can change quite dramatically. Okay, so I'll give you bit by bit by chapter. So just quickly walk through each of the chapters and then I'll give you an example of a single study that I think illustrates a lot of the themes that run throughout the book. So the first chapter is an introduction and it talks about key ideas that run through the book. I think a very important one that I wanna highlight here is that when people think about the digital age, they often think about online. They think about Facebook and Twitter and, and the web. And I wanna emphasize that this is beyond just that. So as I was writing the book, one of the hottest tech trends was in um, the so-called internet of things. 
so-called ubiquitous sensing. And so now many of us have, for example, lots of sensors in our house. Like they may, you may have an Alexa in your house. That is a built-in sensor. Many of us are carrying around phones in the physical world that are sensors. So increasingly, as you imagine, like if you imagine shopping on Amazon, that is like a fully measured digital world that allows for constant experimentation. So we kind of know that now about these websites. Increasingly, we are gonna to move to a situation where that is true about the physical world. So for example, many stores are now investing substantial amounts in tracking customers moving through those stores, building infrastructure to do experimentations in, in the world. So again, when you think about social research in the digital age, don't just think about online, think about everywhere. Uh, and the second kind of theme that runs throughout the book, which I hope that example also illustrates, is that research ethics will be increasingly important. So in the past, research ethics norms around surveys are relatively, I don't know, they can be complicated in certain times, but like generally we have some established norms and rules and it's relatively clear how things are going. In the digital age, you see a lot more new stuff where the norms are much less clear um, and also where the norms are much more blended together. So if a researcher is working at a large tech company, do the ethical norms of academic research apply? Do the research ethics norms of big tech companies apply? What happens as research is more mixed into everyone's daily life? So like a lot of traditional social science research has been pulled outside of their people's lives. Like you're gonna go into a lab and then that's the lab and we're gonna do stuff there or you're gonna be in a survey and like there, the survey starts, then we've got the survey norms, then the survey ends. But increasingly research is getting mixed into our daily life and that creates a number of ethical challenges and a number of ethical responsibilities for us as researchers. So that's a little bit about the introduction. And then the next four chapters are organized around different research designs. Um, so the first research design is observing people's behavior. So this is perhaps the oldest research design it is just looking and seeing what people do. Um, very quickly in the history of social science, people realize that this is not an incredibly powerful design. There are lots of things you cannot learn just by observing people's behavior. However, this is where a lot of the excitement around big data was initially happening. Like, oh, we can keep see what everyone is doing. This is so great. And yes, in some ways it is great. Um, but as we all know, there are things that we can learn when we interact with people that we can't learn just by watching what they do. So in this chapter, I go through some of the common characteristics of big data sources, which in, for me include digital systems and also administrative data. And the key thing you may have heard about big data, you know, the five, three Vs like velocity and variability, there's all these different buzz phrases for how to think about big data. To me, the most important is the five Ws or the one W really, which is why. Why was this data created? Almost always these big data sources are created for some purpose other than research. They're done by companies to help them make money, provide a service. They're collected by governments to fulfill uh, programmatic requirements. And so anytime you take data that is collected for one purpose and you try to use it for another purpose, that is gonna create a lot of challenges. So some of the best features about big data sources come from the fact that they're not created for research and some of the worst characteristics come from that. And we go through that in much more detail in chapter two. So then we say, all right, let's move beyond just watching what people do and let's actually talk to people. And we can learn a lot of things by asking people questions that we can learn just by watching their behavior. This is an obvious idea to everyone on this call at the APOR uh, book club but it's actually really uh, counterintuitive to a lot of data scientists. They, there's a deep, deep distrust of self-reported behavior. Um, and I think that is in part because data scientists are not aware of all of the research that has gone in 
to how we try to learn from people by asking questions. It's not to say that we can always learn perfectly by asking questions, but a lot of the concerns that people have upon first thinking about it have really been addressed and studied carefully for a very, very long time. So this chapter about asking questions goes through uh, the, introduces the total survey error framework, which people on this call are familiar with, and talks about new ways that we can um, figure out who to ask, like how do we do sampling differently, and then new ways of talking to people, um, new ways of interacting with respondents once we've sampled them. So we think about both uh, representation and measurement, and there's a lot of opportunities for improvement in both of those areas. Okay, so then the next chapter though says, well, there's a lot of things that you can learn by asking people questions, but but there's some things that you can't. And so one of the biggest is causality is very hard to do without doing a randomization. And so as you'll notice, each of these steps involves kind of more engagement with the participant. So first observing behavior, you don't have to engage with the people at all. Asking questions involves some level of researcher control. Running experiments involves the researcher having even more control over the people's environment. So Again, the, the beauty of randomized uh, controlled experiments, that is an old idea. Um, but what is new is that we can now run these experiments in much different ways, uh, at much lower costs, much more mixed into everyday environment. And so that creates a lot of opportunities for us to do uh, experimentation in a new way. Then there's an even stronger way that you can interact with your participants which is to create mass collaboration. So this is less common um, in the social sciences previously, but it is common in certain scientific fields like uh, ornithology and astronomy, where instead of studying people, you actually collaborate with them and you work with them and they're involved in the research process. So often you hear about this idea of citizen science um, and, here, I think there's a lot of, one of the things that digital age creates is the abilities for people to communicate in much different ways, as in fact we are doing right now. Um, and we can take advantage of that to make much bigger collaborations. The idea, you know, it took, uh, it took hundreds of scientists working together to sequence the human genome. It took thousands of physicists and engineers working together to find the Higgs boson. And there are a lot of tasks that we could potentially accomplish as social scientists that would require collaboration on that scale. And the digital age enables some of these new forms of collaboration. So those are the four main research designs uh, that I talk about. And I wanna emphasize most of these are about going beyond big data. They're about creating data that you need, which is again, a very a concept very familiar to survey researchers, members of the APOR community. The digital age is not just, let's be stuck with the data that happened to be created. Let's take advantage of the tools of the digital age to create the data that we want. There's also an entire chapter about ethics. So as I mentioned, this is a theme that runs throughout the book. Um, I think, here, again, we can draw on a lot of expertise from social scientists. We, are not, we don't have to make up ethical traditions that already exist. And so in the book, I contrast kind of two approaches that I've seen. So one is among social scientists, I often see a very rules-based approach that's driven by the IRB or the Institutional Review Board. So people say, okay, if the IRB allows this, then I can do this. And I think that is an approach that is lacking in the digital age, because I think many of our ethical oversight processes are not fully capable of understanding all the things happening in the digital age. Second approach that I often see among data scientists is more of an ad hoc approach, rather than a rules-based approach, an ad hoc approach, where they just kind of think about it and they maybe talk about it and they engage with it seriously, but every time they're starting from scratch, they're not drawing on well-established frameworks. And then that makes it expensive and difficult for them to reason through the problems. And it makes it hard to communicate about their reasoning. So there's no reason that we wanna like start 
from scratch every time we would do an ethical review. And so in the book, I advocate for a principles-based approach as being kind of in between this ad hoc approach and the rules-based approach. And the principles that we can follow uh, derive from uh, well-established um, norms in our field. So three come from the Belmont Report, uh, uh, Respect for a Person's Beneficence Justice. The fourth comes from the Menlo Report, which was similar to the Belmont Report, except done among um, computer science researchers. And so they add in a, a fourth principle, which is respect for law and public interest. Um, and so that chapter goes through those principles, talks about how they're derived from even larger ethical frameworks like consequentialism and deontology, and then talks through the specific, uses those principles to then think about some specific challenges that we might be used to, for example, informed consent, privacy, and you can see how these principles help us think about these very complicated problems, uh, hopefully a little bit more clearly. And then the book concludes with some speculation about the future. Uh, and as I said, it's been five years, uh, and at least those, those speculations, I think, have, have borne out pretty well. So this is at a very high level. Now I want to dive into one specific study uh, where you can see a lot of these same ideas in action. Um, I see there's some comments in the chat. Okay, cool. Uh, is there any question now before I go to the specific study? All right, let's go to the specific study. Um, so as I said, the book is about combining ideas from data science and social science and making sure that um, everyone in each of these communities knows that they have something to contribute and something to learn. And one of the kind of a abstract way of thinking about what are some of the biggest cultural differences, I think comes from thinking about art. And so when I think about data science, I often think of this urinal. And so as you all know, this is not just any urinal. This is a very, very special urinal. This is one of my favorite pieces of art. This is Fountain by Duchamp. And so this is an incredibly beautiful piece of art because so Duchamp saw this thing that was created for one purpose, being a urinal. And then he said, you know what? I can repurpose this into something else. This is actually art. So when this kind of repurposing is done well, it is incredibly transformative because it changes the nature of what you think art is. And so this kind of ready-made style I see as being very common among data scientists. So they often take data that was created for one purpose and then they very cleverly repurpose it for something else. So I'll give you an example, the work uh, on Google flu trends. So as you all know, Google search engine, people are typing things into that all the time. Some researchers at Google said, hey, like we could take all this information that people are giving us and try to use this to try to measure the incidence of the flu. And that was a very clever repurposing. And again, it changed what we think is possible. However, as you all know on this call, I think, uh, Google flu trends eventually ran into problems and got shut down, <laughs> which is part of the, the challenge of working with uh, these kind of ready-made data sets is that they don't always have the desirable properties that we might like. So if data scientists are more like Duchamp and Fountain, then what would be an example, what would be a style of art or what would be an, a piece of art that is more consistent with the way social scientists normally work? And so for that, I would pick David. And so when, Michelangelo wanted to make David, he didn't look around for some uh, marble that kind of sort of looked like David and tried to quickly patch it together. He said, I'm gonna take three years to make David, the exact thing I'm trying to make. And so this is an example of a custom made style. And this is, I think, much more familiar to social scientists who are used to thinking very carefully about the data they want, and then going out and creating that data, often at great expense, great difficulty, and large amounts of time. 
And so I think though, increasingly we are gonna see the limits of both of these pure approaches. So for example, we will realize that in fact, there are not that many fountains and there really are a lot of urinals. So in other words, like there are real limits to what you can do with ready-made data. So the limits of the data scientist approach will become more clear and have become more clear. Likewise, for social scientists used to the custom-made approach, it is gonna become increasingly difficult to avoid ready-made data. Like if we say our goal is to learn about the world, then we can't ignore data just because it's not exactly the data that we want. So for example, if you care about improving health, you can say, well, electronic medical records, they're a mess. They don't, they're not collected in the way that I want. And that is completely true. I totally agree. But like, you can't ignore them, right? And the amount of ready-made data is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger every year. And so eventually we're gonna have to figure out how to take advantage of this ready-made data. And I think a key insight for trying to get the best out of both the ready-made and the custom-made data will be about combining them creatively. So taking the best of both of these. And I think survey researchers are in a particularly good position to take advantage of this opportunity to make these hybrid uh, designs. So let me give you an example of one of these hybrid designs. This is from a paper by Josh Blumenstock and colleagues about predicting poverty and wealth from mobile phone metadata. It was published in Science a few years ago. Um, before I tell you about the paper, let me just tell you briefly the problem they were trying to solve. So they were working to eliminate poverty in the world. Okay, so this is a goal I think many people on, the, on this call would be very excited about and happy about. Um, obviously, it is a very hard problem. Um, and one of the many, 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 many challenges you would run into if you were trying to eliminate poverty in the world is to even know how much poverty there is in different places at different times and for different subgroups of people. So I think if we live in wealthy countries, we are used to the idea of a federal statistical system that collects reliable and timely data about vulnerable people. But unfortunately, that's not true all around the world. And so the places where data about poverty is most needed is where it's also most scarce. And so they set out to try to address this problem of measuring poverty. So they started with the call data records from the largest mobile phone provider in Rwanda. So they had call and text records from about 1.5 million customers. So this is an example of a kind of found data set. Then they didn't just try to work with the call records. They said, you know what? The call records don't actually have the thing we care about. They don't actually have measures of people's uh, poverty and wealth calculated using well-designed scales created for the purpose, for this purpose. So they said, you know what? We're gonna take a random sample of these people and we're gonna call them. Cause you know what? We have their phone numbers cause we have their call records and we're gonna give them a traditional social science survey. And then they're able to link together this ready-made and custom-made data in an interesting way. So the first step that they went through to do that is uh, a step called feature engineering. So they took the call records and then they created a big, big matrix where one row is each person and one column is a feature. So feature is a data science term. You could also say variable. Uh, so these features would be things like number of outgoing calls, number of incoming calls, things that you might imagine, but then they're also able to create lots of more complicated features. Like of the people that you call during the week, what's the probability that they call each other? So you can create many, many very rich features from this digital trace data. Um, then what they did is they built a model to try to predict the survey responses from the call records. And so here they're able to use certain kinds of machine learning. So roughly you could think about building a linear regression model. Given certain features, how can I predict how people answer the survey question? In their case, they have a very large number of features, many, uh, and so they need to use um, techniques from machine learning that are designed to work with large numbers of features. And so you, in this model, you might find a pattern like people who make international calls 
tend to be wealthier. That would be an example of something this model would show, but also because there are many, many features, this model is able to pick up other things as well. So then you can use this model to essentially impute the survey responses for all the other people in the data set. So there's 1.5 million people in this data set. They've called about a thousand of them. They've learned then the relationship between the digital trace data and the surveys. And then they use that to impute the responses for the other 1.499 million people. The next thing they did is they imputed every, where everyone lives. So the residence location is not in the data, uh, but it turns out that where what cell tower you're at uh, when you make calls at night is a pretty good approximation of where you live. So this is how they're able to combine this ready-made and custom-made data and they produce a map like this. This is part of Rwanda, a high resolution map of poverty. So I wanna call your attention to this cell right here, this square. This is a one kilometer by one kilometer square. So they're able to produce incredibly fine, small area estimates, incredibly small uh, about the amount of poverty. So you can imagine these estimates would be um, very useful for tracking progress and targeting resources where it's most needed. Now, you may ask how accurate are these estimates? And the answer is we don't really know because no one has been able to make estimates this precise before. And this is a common challenge you see in computational social science where often you make an estimate and it's very hard to assess that estimate because it has never been made before. But fortunately, um, we are able to compare to somewhat of a gold standard estimate that comes from the demographic and health survey. So the if we aggregate, so here now is the estimates that they made aggregated to the regional level. So there are 30 regions in Rwanda. And now we can compare it to estimates that come from the demographic and health survey, which is a large probability sample face-to-face, -face, like a, it's not perfect, but it's best practices of face-to-face -face data collection. And so here are the estimates that come from the demographic and health survey. So for the purposes of this call, I'm gonna say they match. Uh, in the paper, they go through great detail talking about how close they are. I'm gonna say, these are pretty close. So you might say, well, that's great, but like we already had the ability to do the demographic and health survey. Why do we need all this phone data and machine learning and stuff like that? And one thing I haven't told you is that the newer method is 10 times faster and 50 times cheaper. So I wanna just repeat that for a second, 10 times faster and 50 times cheaper. 50 times cheaper is not 10% cheaper. 50 times cheaper is qualitatively different. So let me say, I do not think that we should cut the budget of the demographic and health surveys by a factor of 50. That's not what I'm advocating for. But what we can do is increase the amount of data collection that we do. So for example, right now, demographic and health surveys happen roughly every five years. But in wealthy countries, people don't have to wait five years to learn about what's happening in their society. We produce lots of estimates at the monthly level. And so if these estimates were actually 50 times cheaper to create, lots of countries can move to substantially higher frequencies of data collection. So that study to me is a beautiful example of combining ready-made and custom-made data. It also does a really good job of illustrating what I think, who are the, some of the biggest stakeholders in this kind of work. So some of it is companies that have data. Some of it is governments that want estimates. Some of it is uh, researchers that have the capability of combining all of this stuff to make these estimates. And so there's a lot of opportunity to, for different people in this ecosystem to work together. So when you think about the future of computational social science, I hope you will think about this. All right, so that's a little bit about bit by bit. Um, I wanna now briefly just mention a couple of things I'm working on now, because I know there are, I expect there are a lot of people on this call from the federal statistical system. 
And I just want to say that is where I actually started my career. My first job out of college was working at the Census Bureau um, on the uh, 2000 census, working on the coverage estimates. Um, so I think there's still lots of opportunity to combine ideas from data science and social science. So my current projects are doing that now. Um, one is I'm starting just starting to do some work on foundation models. So foundation models are these um, very, very large models. Like maybe you're familiar with ChatGPT. So ChatGPT is the service that you can interact with. It's based on this uh, large language model that's trained on an enormous corpus of data. Um, I think these same ideas that are used to make chat GPT and specifically make foundation models have potential to have a lot of positive benefits in um, social science and with social data. And I think one of the only source, one of the things that these models require is enormous amounts of data and enormous compute capacity. And I think one of the only group entity that has this amount of data and compute capacity other than large tech companies is the US federal government. And in the same way that there's the claim that these large language models can have many positive downstream uses, it may be the case that foundation models trained on social data could also have many exciting downstream uses. Um, the second thing I'm working on now is stuff about the limits to prediction. So as you, um, people who are excited about big data and machine learning. Um, sometimes people, when they're working in these areas, they, they think about new data sources, but they don't think as much about the data that we already have if we just ask different questions about it. And so if you hang out with computational social scientists, one of the things they often talk about is predictive accuracy. So this comes a lot from computer scientists who are used to thinking of predictive accuracy as a metric of scientific understanding. And so attempts to bring high levels of predictive accuracy into social data don't seem to have been very effective. I, for example, have tried and failed and I've worked on it now for several years and trying to understand why it keeps failing. And so I'm very interested in what are the processes that create fundamental limits to social prediction. So for example, we know that we're not gonna be able to predict perfectly the weather three months from now because of things we understand about the atmosphere. So there are theories that lead to fundamental limits of long-term prediction in the weather. So what are the theories that lead to fundamental uh, limits to prediction in social settings? Again, this is an area where I think federal statistical system could be very valuable because a lot of these questions require large amounts of data to be able to try to measure what is that fundamental limit. And then the third thing, is about distribution shifts. And so this is about if you train a machine learning model, let's say in one city to try to predict uh, which kids will drop out of school. And then you use that model in a different city, it turns out it often doesn't do nearly as well. So oftentimes when you change the distribution that, you're that you learn on one distribution and then you try to apply it on some different statistical distribution, the performance seems to drop a lot. And so we're very interested in understanding, measuring the magnitude of these for the kinds of predictions that social scientists often wanna do, and then uh, developing techniques to try to mitigate uh, this kind of problems with distribution shift. And again, having access to very large data sets helps with the study of distribution shift. So those are some current research projects. Um, I'm also working on a book project this year during my sabbatical. It's all about predicting the future. So what we can do, what we can't do, and how we can tell the difference. If you're interested in any of these things um, or you're currently working on them, uh, send me an email. I'm curious what else people out there are doing on these topics. So coming back now to bit by bit, um, there is gonna be someone in this call who wins a free copy. Um, everyone in the call can go and start reading the book right now uh, at bitbybitbook.com. The whole book is there free. Uh, for everyone to read. Um, also, this book emerged out of a class that I've taught for many years at Princeton. And I know that teaching computational social science is, is it's one of the most important things that we'll do to train future researchers. It's also very hard and time consuming. 
And so it would be great if we could all share our teaching materials more so we can all be better teachers faster. And so I've posted all of my teaching materials related to this book and other people have posted their teaching materials when they've used this book in their own course. And so you can find all of those materials at this website. And uh, you can also contribute materials if you're using bit by bit in a course. And finally, uh, you can also buy a physical copy of the book and there are links to different um, online bookstores at bitbybitbook.com. And you can also of course buy it in a physical bookstore if you'd like. Um, so that is it. And I look forward to the discussion period. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. That was incredible and very informative. Um, we now have time for a couple of questions. Um, I'm gonna encourage you to please turn on your camera if you're comfortable and ask your question. Um, why don't we have folks raise their hand um, with the Zoom function so we don't accidentally talk over each other. Um, and it would be great if when you ask your question, you could give your name and your affiliation. So we'll now open it up to discussion. I see there's one message in the chat about predicting um, election outcomes. Sure. Does the yeah. person who asked that question want to elaborate a little bit on, on that question, Mr. Frankel? Hi, everyone. I'm not in the best position to talk. I'm, I'm with uh, other people in a public space. <laughs> but uh, I, so I'm just sort of a fly on the wall learning more. Why are we so bad at predicting the outcomes of an election? And like, how can we use ready-made data and combine it with a custom solution to get better at, at doing that type of prediction? And I'm just gonna mute myself and listen. Cool. Um, I think uh, people on this call are probably better at answering that question than me, given that this is DC APOR. Um, but what I would say is maybe we're really not that bad at predicting elections in the sense that there is a certain thing about the U.S. election system that maps the vote share to the winner. And that rule is very complicated. And it depends on where we are. There are like these thresholds. And so if you think the election will be close, you might be able to predict the vote share reasonably accurately, but not predict the actual winner. So this is an example of a more general kind of mechanism that makes predictability difficult in social systems, which is kind of thresholding behavior. So if you have a system that changes qualitatively right around a certain cut point, um, then you have, and, and if the system tends to drive itself to that cut point, then predictability is going to be difficult. So why did I mention the system driving itself to that cut point? So I, there's theories in political science about how political parties change their behavior to attract the median voter. So there's a lot of mechanisms at play that drive us towards this point of high unpredictability. If, if they were very, um, so I think there are parts, there, there are many other part mechanisms in social systems where there is a point um, where predictability becomes difficult and there are mechanisms that drive us to that point. Another example could be, for example, the stock market. So I can't predict very accurately what's gonna happen to the price of stocks in the future. Um, part of this is because people are constantly adjusting the prices of those stocks till it gets to the point where prediction becomes difficult. And so this is an important way that um, social systems differ from certain kinds of natural physical systems is that the behavior of people can often drive those systems to the point of unpredictability. So that'd be an example of the kind of thing that um, I'll be writing about some in my book. Great. Any other questions? Giacomo. Hi there, I'm Giacomo. I work at something called the Association of American Universities. Um, I guess I was very struck by your example about Rwandan uh, sort of poverty. Um, are there any other sort of collaborations between data science and social science happening now 
that you are excited about? Yeah, uh, yeah it's a very, very active area. Um, I think one of the studies that I think is a very interesting um, next step from the work of Blumenstock at all was people then tried to combine, it turns out that what Josh has told me is that one of the hardest parts of that study was getting access to the mobile phone data. And that makes sense because the mobile phone data has a lot of sensitive information in it. And, and, comp and it has a lot of valuable commercial information in it. So it's hard to get access. So one way around this is researchers have tried a similar thing with uh, satellite images. So satellite images serve as a different form of ready-made data, which you can combine with survey data. And from satellite images, it turns out you can predict poverty uh, reasonably well, uh, because you can imagine the characteristics of houses in wealthier areas and poor areas are different. They can even see the difference between paved roads and dirt roads and so on. And then building on that, people have tried, then Blumenstock et al. tried to do this like around the world uh, in, in collaboration with some researchers from uh, Meta or Facebook. Um, so you can see what, what I like is how the, the scale of these things evolves very quickly. And I think it's also a really good example of how this, the difference in um, like cost structure between traditional methods and digital methods, because this is another theme that runs throughout the book. So the like the if you if you took a traditional survey and you wanted to scale it up to the entire and you wanted to double the number of countries, that costs roughly double the money. And if you want to have 10 times as many countries, costs 10 times as much money. And so that makes it very hard to get really, really big things. So it's high, high variable costs. With a lot of digital product um, research, there's much higher fixed costs up front and then much lower uh, variable cost. So once you've built a machine learning model that can take satellite data and combine it with survey data, then you can very cheaply put in satellite data from all over the world. And so to me, this is one of the most exciting things about digital methods is the speed through which I mean, they did this uh, study in Rwanda in 2015, and five years later, it was done at a global scale. And you just don't see that kind of pace happening in the past using uh, more traditional methods. And so I think that's one of the things that's most exciting about these digital techniques is they enable us to very quickly move to a different scale and allow us to answer, ask and answer questions that we could not have asked or answered otherwise. Any other questions? I have a question, but I'll sure. keep it unless other people want to speak up first. Okay, I'll go ahead. Um, you briefly mentioned uh, chat GPT. This is something that I'm very interested in um, just because of its novel capabilities. I've never seen anything like that. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about um, the applications that you're seeing, whether it be in sociology or applying it to to some of the digital research that you're doing um, and where you think that this is gonna take us in the future. Yeah, so I see, I, I know there is some stuff happening now. Um, I, it's not really, I don't think people are directly using ChatGPT for research right now. Um, I've seen people trying to see to what extent it can recreate um, cognitive biases. So maybe some of you know the work by Kahneman and Tversky, like you could ask ChatGPT the same thing and see how it does. So there are people kind of messing around with it. Um, but I think, uh, so that's kind of one set of things we can do. I think another set of things we can do, one that I think is more interesting and that isn't happening yet, as far as I know, is that we can take advantage of some of the same underlying uh, ideas in the machine learning that they've done and try to build uh, large foundation models for other kinds of tasks, not just for text, uh, not just for images, 
how we would actually do that is completely unclear. So I think the path to like using ChatGPT right away, there will be like specific examples that people can do today, like the Kahneman and Tversky style things. Um, I think some of the most interesting stuff though will be to what extent we can repurpose those technologies um, and use them on the kinds of data that we're interested in and use them to try to answer the kinds of questions that we're interested in. Because ChatGPT was created not to answer social science research questions, right? So we can try to repurpose it uh, to answer social science research questions. But I also think we can think about trying to do custom made foundation models um, with trained on enormous amounts of data set uh, data um, that can serve kind of general purpose. So I think just to clarify, one of the big things that's exciting about these foundation models is like traditionally, if I was gonna build a machine learning model, I would have to build that model for one specific very narrow task. So Josh Blumenstock and his colleagues built it to predict survey answers. Okay, so that's the kind of world that we're used to task by task. So what ChatGPT seems to be doing is it's able to do many different kinds of tasks from the same model. So the question is, can we create a single, sometimes they're called foundation models that can do many different tasks or can be fine tuned to do many different tasks. And then if we could build this foundation model, that would potentially improve our ability to do many, many, many different tasks. And so I think that's a particularly exciting thing. There's a um, really nice review paper from a group at Stanford that um, came out recently about these foundation models. I'll put that in the chat. So other, if anyone's interested, they could check it out. Great, thank you. Uh, and thank you so much, Professor Salganik, for participating in this series. It's been wonderful. And for all of you for joining and making it a success. Now for the moment you've all been waiting for to announce the book winner. The DC APOR member that has won a copy of today's book is Jennifer Berktold. We'll be in touch with you shortly to get details for sending you the book. Um, before you all leave, I have a quick survey in true APOR fashion for you to just fill out. Um, a link has been posted in the chat. And finally, I want to highlight uh, Stas Kolenikov's message in the chat about the Big Serve 23 conference, the interaction of social science and intensive compute come together. So abstract submissions are open through February 24th. And please submit. Thank you so much um, for everybody that's joining. We don't have a scheduled book club yet. Um, but stay tuned on our listserv to find out more about when the next one is happening. Thank you. Thank you.